Thank you for joining us wherever you are. This podcast episode is brought to you by the Old Ways Actual Play Team. This actual play uses the 7th edition Call of Cthulhu tabletop role-playing game, Rules by Chaosin. This actual play is performed by adults and in an adult setting. While we try hard to stick to reasonable languages for all ages, listeners should know that this is a podcast that may include mature themes. All content, including names, places, events, companies, and etc., may bear resemblance to persons living or dead, is strictly coincidental. My name is Michael Diamond, and for tonight's game, I will be your keeper. And welcome, everyone, to the season one finale of the Old Ways podcast. We welcome you in tonight with a very special crew. Uh, to my right, introductions, if you would. Uh, yes, this is Lonnie. I'll be playing uh, Lawrence Edward Oliver Forsyth. Man of Adventure. Man of Adventure at the end of the table. This is Jake. I'm playing Jack Doyle, Private Investigator. Uh, to his right. James, as always, playing Dr. Sigmund Tausenbach. And uh, last but not least. Uh, Tiffany playing Maeve O'Shea. Awesome. So I'm going to raise the curtain tonight a few months after the last episode. So it's, say, early to mid-May. We won't put too fine of a point on it, but... Mm-hmm. It's early to mid-May in Chicago, 1923, and it's an unseasonably warm May. You've all had a little time to do some of the things that you've got cooked up, some of the things we talked about you finishing up between the sessions, and you've managed to make it to the weekend. It's now Saturday. And I'm going to begin tonight's episode with Mr. Doyle. It's Saturday. It's about 10 a.m. You're just getting around to waking up. And the unfortunate reason behind your waking is the mail slot in your home opens and something drops onto the floor. Well, I hope that's not a bill. Um... You can't really make it out from here. You can kind of sort of see the front door from your kind of a, oh, I don't want to say Spartan living conditions, but somewhat basic living conditions. You, most of your money's tied up in the office at this point. Right. What with the getting new glass and, you know, getting a new front door after it was shot full of bullets. Well, you know, these, these things cost. All right, I will literally stumble over to the door. You stumble to the door. Uh, you see a brownish envelope. Uh, it looks like uh, some sort of messenger envelope. I'll rip it up. Open it up. You open it up. It's from a lawyerly contact in New York. Ooh. Ramsey. Oh. And he says in it, I have someone who wishes to talk to you. Can you gather everyone at the doctor's office? Hmm. Be prepared. Saturday, 8 p.m. All right. Um, I'll go make a couple phone calls. Okay. Go ahead. Um, Bring up the doctor. Okay. Doctor, it's 10-ish or so on Saturday, so you're probably still upstairs, I'd imagine. Yeah. Yeah, probably. Um, One moment. One moment. Uh, Good Doc. Hi, uh, Doc. This is Doyle. Ah, Mr. Doyle. What can I do for you? Uh, I um, I think we might have somebody wants to talk to us. You know, Ramsey, the, the lawyer, helped us out with that whole uh, murder thing. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he says he has somebody who wants to talk to the lot of us. All right. And uh, would you like to do it at the office? Yeah, yeah. Tonight about eight. Absolutely. Do you want me to help you gather the rest of them? Yeah, could you call Miss O'Shea and I'll call um, Forsyth? I'm supposed to be speaking to her this afternoon anyway, so I'll call her a little earlier. All right. Hmm. Click. Go ahead, Doctor, make your other call. All right. Dial up O'Shea 65000. <laughs> <laughs> Hello? Miss O'Shea? Yes. Maeve, it's Dr. Dr. Um, There's someone... 
Do you remember the lawyer Ramses? Mm. Helped us out. No? Well, there's somebody who wishes to speak to us, and we need to gather together tonight at my office. Oh, okay. So I figured instead of our meeting this evening, perhaps we just meet at the office. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Sounds good. Wunderbar. Goodbye. Ring up Forsyth. Mm. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm probably sitting reading. Um, answer the phone. Hello? Edward, this is uh, Doyle. Oh, hi, Jack. Um, you know, if somebody wants to... You remember the lawyer that helped us out in that murder investigation way back uh, no. in January or February? No. No? Oh, okay. No. It must have been something on your end. It wasn't, yeah. wasn't on mine. He, he had a couple contacts back and forth. Anyhow, he uh, has somebody who wants to talk to the lot of us. So we thought maybe we'd be to the doc's office about 8 o'clock. Um, uh, very well. Uh, what about? I don't know, but if it's the whole group of us, it's probably uh, nothing natural. <sighs> Probably not. That's reasonable right. to assume. Right. Yeah. He's not wrong. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So the most of your day goes for each of you as a pretty common Saturday would. Um, the weather is decent out. Uh, there hasn't been any rain probably in the past two or three days. And the city is starting to heat up a little bit. Those of you who've lived in Chicago most of your life or in the area kind of know what I'm talking about in the regard that the air starts to pick up a certain hum because the temperature doesn't fully completely fall down anymore. Now it's staying warm at night. And for the most part, it's a pleasant respite from the rains of early March and eventually into April. And the city starts to hum a little bit. When the time comes, you arrive, each of you, at the doctor's office, the hub, as it has been so often, <laughs> and uh, one by one file in. Evening, Mr. Doyle. Evening. I've put on a pot of coffee. No, oh, thank you. Mm. Miss O'Shea, <laughs> coffee. Thank you. Get you. You want to get you some? If you don't mind. Can we Irish it up? If you don't mind. No. <laughs> I prefer mine German, thank you. Right. <laughs> Mr. Forsyth, there's coffee on. Uh, yes. Um, uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like you need a cup. Yeah, have some. <laughs> Is it distressing to you that everybody seems to know that we gather here now? I find that to be a little distressing, yeah. Mm. <laughs> We might have to change it up and start going to your office. Well, I mean, we can. It's just not as comfortable. I would prefer not to go to your office, Mr. Doyle, considering <laughs> the number of times you've had to replace almost everything. Oh, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just pointing out the, you know, that's, that's, that's fair. <laughs> We're going to say for uh, the matters of continuity uh, that Miss Fairchild is here. Okay. She is present. As the clock on the wall, that beautiful hanging clock, ticks closer and closer to eight, you can kind of feel a bit of sweat in your palms. You're starting to now watch the second hand. How's my stone? Mm, still mostly the same. It still has, uh, at this point, still has a relative bit of the cool touch at this point. The first bong when the clock happens is eight hits. It, c it continues for seven more German precision time strikes until the eighth ring echoes throughout the bottom of the doctor's office. Punctual. Oh, I Dr. Tottenbach's office. Dr. Tottenbach speaking. Doctor, you hear a um, 
maybe a familiar voice? Sounds... <clears throat> this is Dr. Tartenbach. How can I help you? Doctor, do me a favor. Do you have a table you can put the receiver down on? I sure do. One moment. You set it down. Can you all hear me? You hear, like, it sounds like someone's shouting. Yes. I'm glad you were all together. I wanted to get a few things straight with you. You instantly know who this voice is. Ramsey. This is Jackson Elias. Oh. I know it's been a few months since we've talked, but I'm getting ready to do a little traveling, and I wanted to make sure that I got some things off my chest before before I kept moving. What happened to you a few months ago is, from what Ramsey said, is pretty dramatic. And I wouldn't normally have gotten involved, of course, at the time. What with Miss O'Shea's deducted work. But I have to confess, it wasn't the first time we'd spoke. You see, I know you. I know all of you. We met several years ago in Lima, Peru. Except, uh, I was using a, a fictional name, of course, which was working just splendidly until Mr. Doyle here began poking around New York and asking about it. Jesse. Jesse Hughes. That's right. Wow. Hey. I'm sure you have a lot of questions. And so I'm here to do my level best to answer those questions. So you remember everything? Uh, uh, I remember, yes, I remember everything. I remember things, Miss O'Shea, I wish I could forget. You might understand what I mean by that. Why do you know why we didn't remember? I have an idea. Would you like me to start at the end or the beginning? Please start at the beginning, Mr. Elias. In early February of 1921, I read in the New York paper here that there was an expedition that was being planned for Peru. I inquired because I was doing some research about um, South American cults. <coughs> I thought it'd be fun to, I thought it'd be fun to tag along and see about getting some information. And so I wrote uh, to a gentleman, and all of you were at least somewhat familiar with at this point, a man by the name of Augustus Larkin. Mm -hmm. Larkin was impressed with my letter, and he invited me down to take part in the expedition. We met in a bar one night with Larkin and the rest of his men. I, I'll never forget it. Uh, I'll never forget Larkin's men fawning over Miss Fairchild or uh, Larkin refusing to shut up about how much money we were all going to make. And all this wonderful treasure everyone was going to find. And how the tale that was going to be told for eternity about this untold, untapped riches we'd, we'd secured. I remember... I remember the doctors came. And... I remember thinking that you all were some pretty pretty special folks. 
And I was proven right later on when things went south. We left the hotel and we went into the countryside on horseback. We traveled and then eventually came to a couple of villages. We stopped for supplies. During one of these stops, we came to the realization that one of Larkin's men was foul. A traitor? No, no, he was... Monster? That's the best way to put it. A man named Mendoza. And during an altercation, Mr. Doyle and Mr. Forsyth, uh, I tell you, they... You all put so much lead in his body, I don't think a human man could could take much more. After he revealed himself for whatever he was, rows of teeth, I'd never seen it before. We managed to get out of that room with uh, something that had burned his hand. This gold inlay. So it was like a half circle, right? No, no, this was a... This was a piece that was, I don't know, I'd say a... But it went, it was only half of it. It was a, almost, it looked like a border of a big picture frame or a puzzle. That's right. And he had burned himself on it, and so I think, yeah, we picked it up. And that's when we found out that Larkin was missing. We later found him in his hotel room, deader than a doornail. He evidently had a, some sort of problem with drugs. I found some. We, doctor, you found mm-hmm. some hypodermics on him. Mm-hmm. This just checks. This checks out with what we know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We continued on with the maps. That and using Mister Forsyth's expertise to plot us away there. And then we got to the temple, and we managed our way through. We saw some fetid pile. I will not forget the pile of fetid rags we saw. And we watched it move on its own accord. And then we went deeper. Down into a long, long tunnel. Where we encountered a body of water. But it wasn't water, it was... Some sort of black pool or ichor. And we saw that there was a crack in the wall. That crack had some sort of substance coming out of it. Some sort of, I don't know, like pus or fat or flesh or something. And then right there, right on the wall, there was more of that gold inlay. And so you all decided that with the piece that we'd taken, that we were going to make it right. Heck, Forsyth and Doyle built a, a raft, pushed themselves out on it. Into the pool. Yeah. Yeah, and you were the one screaming, tell them not to, not to do it. That sounds like me. Not, not to go too far. Not to, not to get. Uh, what did you say? Uh, unbalanced, something like that. And we sealed it. At least, I think we did. And that's when everything changed. The two of you came back to shore, the, the solid earth, and you started talking crazy. Languages I'd never heard of before. And suddenly you were at each other's throats. As if you were angry at one another over something. And it was all I could do to to pull you apart. And that's when I saw him. Larkin? Larkin. Somehow, some way, he was standing at the end of that long hall. Whispering words no man has any right to speak. In a tongue... That couldn't possibly have been, couldn't possibly fit inside that body. The tones, the depth, 
I felt it in my skull. He called me Elias. And that's when I put a bullet in him. Because I never told him my name was Elias. He er erupted in some scream. I, I still hear it sometimes when I sleep. But it chased us from the, the, whole, the whole temple. We ended up in the surrounding area and picked through the jungle for a good half day before we found our way back to civilization. So then why were we in the hospital? Well, that's partly my fault. Part of the reason we were in the hospital was I tried and failed to talk the folks on the train service into letting you on as you were. You you got to understand, you were you were not in your right mind. None of you were. And I tried to console them and then I tried to pay them and they didn't like that at all they thought you were all diseased and so I had to lie to them and tell them that you were being transported north we were going to, to Los Angeles to go to a, uh, a hospital there because they'd said that they could treat you and that's how we got back to the states and I stayed with you for I don't know, the better part of two months in Los Angeles, just nursing you back to reasonable mental state. And then we jumped a train to Chicago. I made sure each one of you had, you know, people that could look after you, whether it be a neighbor, just check in on you. Or, well, I got to meet Lily, doctor. She's a fine lady. She is quite. And then I swore to myself I wasn't coming back to Chicago ever. Because I'd already done enough harm and I had to find out, <laughs> I had to find out if I could get my skeptical brain to believe in anything at that point. That's what happened in Peru. So then the damage that we, su that we suffered in Peru is what led us to not being able to remember. I checked into it. One of the doctors I know out here, I've had a couple of correspondence with, and they've said it's uh, repressed memories. I've, I've come across something similar in my research as well. There's a... I guess one of the doctors out here said that the, the brain will will cover up like, a, like somebody trying to recover from a cold chill. They'll cover it right up, like the memories never even happened. And that the danger is, is somewhere down the line, something can spark that memory and it can snap right, up, right back to the present. And that's what's starting to happen with us. In my research, repressed memories only stay repressed for so long, especially when they are painful and large. I know for certain... Larkin's dead. I made sure of it before we left. There's no way he lived through what happened. But I think our our experience that we had here is why we started having those memories again. What experience? Um, another creature that was here. By creature, what do you mean? Well, a cult, a giant three-eyed lizard. Yeah. yeah snake. Snake. Sagua? No, his name is Yig, actually. Ah, that. Yeah. I think I've heard that name before. And during he, the, during the time we were, uh, we had, you had contacted us originally. Yeah. That's what we were dealing with, and hmm. we shut down the cult. The thing still lives underneath the city, but it's, we believe that if no one can call it, then it will just see come down. We hope anyhow. Thank you, Lee. I went through a lot putting that thing to sleep. 
Oh, you're more talented than I am, that's for sure. Didn't really have a choice. We, we couldn't fight it. Yeah, I believe it. Out of character, I'm just looking at all of them because I saw none of this. <laughs> oh yeah, you were fighting. Yeah, I was. I was facing the other way the entire time. Yeah. Right. Never saw a thing. <laughs> so is that one case? He's the guy in the movie that doesn't see the big bad thing until it's too late. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. Or right. like my Turns favorite. And it's right there. Or my favorite scene in Shaun of the Dead where he slips in the blood in yes. the convenience <laughs> store. Yep. yep. Absolutely. <laughs> He, uh, you can hear him kind of move. There's a bit of a rustle on the speaker. Uh, I just want to make sure you understand I did everything I could. And I hope, (laughs) I hope you're lucky enough to let sleeping dogs lie when it comes to some of those memories. Yeah, I don't know. Well, if Larkin's dead... And the creature's asleep, I don't know that we should necessarily mess with it. There is no if about that, Mr. Doyle. Larkin is dead. Right. Obviously, we have to take your word for it, because we well, don't remember. I I did, the, I did the better part of five rounds into his head. There is no way... There's nothing left of it. Forgive me for saying so, but he died twice during that expedition, according to you. I don't think he died the first time. I think we found him overdosed, and we believed he was dead. Assumed he was dead. And for that matter, the doctor was not with us when we found him. If I was not with you to check the pulse and to check the life vitals, then it is possible he was not dead. An overdose of morphine or heroin... Heroin. Quite easily, yeah. But Larkin was into something. He had to have been. The voice he spoke with, there's no way... It it wasn't a human voice. It was something else. Well, I see no reason for us to go down there. No reason for us to pry too far. We've... we've, Yeah, yeah, please don't. (laughs) I mean, by talking to you, we've already pieced together the missing... Right. puzzle that we needed so yeah there's no I don't foresee us delving any deeper into this I have a fairly successful medical practice I'm not looking to go anywhere right now you all have lives I have lives I have I have something I have to do I won't be in New York very long I have some traveling to do but if you are ever in New York, maybe you can stop by. See Rams. Yeah. Um, if you don't mind me asking, where are you going? You can hear him hesitate on the phone. I can't tell you, Mr. Doyle. i got to check a few things out. That's fair. I won't be in New York, though. Though, I may call on you in the future. You never know. You're all very resourceful. Well, you know where to find us. Yeah. And thank you for staying with us in the hospital. Well, my mother raised a gentleman. You can't just leave a lady in the depths of Peru all by herself. I mean, she'd, she'd have my head. With raving madmen, apparently. Well, I don't know that that's changed. <laughs> not so much raving anymore. True. All right, then, you You have a good evening. I'm going to get off Ramsey's phone. He's probably going to kill me for being on this long. <laughs> you have a good night. Thank you. You as well. Thank you. And good luck. Thank you. you hear the phone give off a heavy click. I hang up the receiver. Well, that, that ties everything together nicely, I think. Yeah. A little unsettling, though. Well? Because it's almost like too neat. In our line of things we've come across, I don't know. But I'm willing to leave it be for now. I have other things to worry about. Do we? I didn't say we. I said I do. We all have our own lives uh, we're leading. 
And if we don't need to delve into something that doesn't appear to be uh, causing us any problems out now. We are the worst adventurers. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, not at all. Not at all. This is, um, this is, this is the epilogue. This is what happens at the end of the season. Um, I think you probably each have had a few weeks anyways, given that it's May. We've had a few weeks to examine the stone that Mr. Forsyth gave you. And you have begun to become a little attached to it. And I think as this conversation has gone, you would have noticed that it continues to it continues to grow in warmth. It has gotten steadily warmer. Is there any way I can have it set as like a pendant or something? Oh, absolutely. Okay. I mean, the stone itself, you, I mean, it's, it's only this big. It can absolutely be a pendant. It's, I'm sorry, listeners, this big is maybe (laughs) three or four inches, maybe. Uh, There's a obelisk point to it. It is a little sharp in the sense that the point is pretty direct, like a pencil. Mm -hmm. So you could absolutely set that if you wanted to. So really the question is, is where do the investigators go from here? I've given you all a little time to think over what comes next. And so, say for the next year and a half or so, I want you to tell me, Mr. Forsyth, what he plans on doing with his time. Well, I'm going to be completely honest here when I say that um, although working on the McCormick Tower was going to be a basically a capstone. Yeah. That's a great turn of phrase there, Capstone. Yeah. If, if I'm honest about it, um, my experiences with the Foundation were very upsetting and made me not want to go back to the work site nearly as much as I originally wanted to. I think so that's fair. I would be, um, how, how would the kids nowadays say it? Looking for an exit out the business? You're looking uh, for an exit. You're exiting stage left. <laughs> yes. Okay, so you probably, are you going to do any work there? Or are you just going to kind of get the initial stuff done and then pull the ripcord? Uh, I, I would probably hang on for as long as possible because um, I'm also trying to get back to a more normal bit of life. Um, sure. Something that doesn't involve being shot by strange people or hearing um, friends and co-workers babble about monsters. Um, <laughs> he didn't get the memo. No, 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 it must not have. Okay, so you work for the colonel for a little while. Yeah. You earn a little bit of pocket cash, and then Lazo's probably sorry to see you go. You're a good worker, you're a smart guy, you're a good crew leader, but they respect your position, and... Yeah. And you move on. So after that, what do you think he'd do? Well, um, this whole incident um, kind of sparks a mini renaissance in me because um, I'd always been interested in stuff like the archaeology and things like that. Anyways, um, it's one reason I subscribed to the National Geographic. And as it turns out, in the May issue Mm -hmm. is this absolutely fantastic discovery of a uh, tomb in Egypt. Oh, my. And um, I figure that the congruence of myself, my personal history, these big things that are happening now, Mm -hmm. and um, I I should probably be more aware of things that... uh, happened in the long ago so i would i would start researching this sort of thing okay well there aren't um there's not a lot of research well there's not archaeology classes per se no there are people that you know through um miss fairchild who are part of the history department at the university of chicago that could lend themselves to you a bit and probably would given Mm -hmm. Given the things that you've done for them, you let them sleep in the house for probably a day or two or maybe more until the, you know, that was passed. And so yeah. I would imagine Mary would probably pitch in and help, um, maybe not 
maybe educate you a little bit directly, give you a little tutoring, but also put you onto some books that you could read on your own. Books and also people who um, may have done expeditions. Well, and there are there probably aren't there there are definitely not so much papers, but there are scholarly yeah books that have been written specifically yeah. about certain locations. So yeah, absolutely. Yes. Okay, so you're doing that, and then is there anything else you think he would spend his time doing, if um, that's your main thrust? Not, not really. I mean, I wouldn't. I would keep my hand in business enough to maintain my lifestyle, but it wouldn't be the focus anymore. The focus sure. would be more about my natural curiosity on all of this. Okay. Yeah, sounds good. So we'll we'll leave you temporarily in that state. That's the, the thrust of what Mr. Forsyth is doing. So what I want to know is, from you, Mr. Doyle, what does a detective fill his time with? Well, detecting. Okay. <laughs> Investigating. And drinking. And drinking. And Remember, <clears throat> you're hard, hard drinking, hard smoking, hard living, Jack Doyle. That's right. So obviously I'm, I'm still trying to help Sazi. Yes. With her problem. With her problem. Okay. Um, and I, you know, I do eventually manage to help her obtain a divorce from Herman. Okay. Yeah, the the process is probably fairly lengthy, actually, given the 1920s divorce speed, uh, especially when there's two parties that might not see eye to eye. So you probably have one or maybe two, let's just say direct encounters with Herman where you have to um, speak very plainly about what's going to happen and what's not going to happen. And one of them actually comes uh, when Herman tries to snatch her like in a public street and pu put her in a car when you have to put a stop to it. Uh, so it isn't probably for another, I don't know, year or so. But she does eventually get him to give her the divorce that she's asking for. It's a um, kind of on again, off again. Probably like a lot of your investigations are. You probably pick up one thread and then you see a new job and you pick up that thread and go th go through that route. So that's probably sure the way that, it goes. It's a very long, lengthy, part-time kind of thing. Right. I admire your restraint and not just dumping him in the Chicago River. Oh, trust me, if I thought I could get away with it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's probably an on-again, off-again thing that you're going to do. What else do you think Doyle would fill his time with? Well, I'm also helping Miss O'Shea find her uh, um, intruder. Oh, her intruder. Yes, her bedroom intruder. No, it's a different song. Uh, <laughs> so... The way this shakes out and probably takes a couple of months to, to get to the full bottom of it is that it appears after you case her house for a little while, you notice that the person that comes down and kind of not walks their dog, does something in effect in the public eye to come down towards the corner there, ends up being her neighbor. And he paces back and forth for several minutes at a time. And his eyes are basically stapled to her windows and it happens again and again and eventually you have to have an encounter with him he on the other hand unlike Herman he uh, he flees from you he's terrified uh, and at one point calls the police and that's when you use some of your law enforcement contacts to determine that to maybe somebody within the Chicago Police Department was letting this guy off a little light. And the final part of the investigation comes when you find out it wasn't just that they were letting him off light, it's that they were helping him do it. The good old Chicago Police Department. No you, offense to any Chicago Police Department. This is the we, 20s. Totally we do different. have many people in Chicago and the surrounding areas that listen, so, yeah, obviously it's... it's, it's The 20s are different. Sure. <laughs> Plus, it's a, it's a fiction. Soon, soon Mr. Doyle will be broadcasting from Holman Square. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you do get the situation resolved. Uh, it is probably something that makes Miss O'Shea a little bit... Uh, first, probably a little bit uneasy... 
and probably in the end a little bit relieved. Yes, because we we absolutely thought it was going to be connected to uh, the other investigation we were part of. Yeah, you know, the thing about investigations is that just because they look alike and maybe talk alike doesn't mean that they are alike. Right. Uh, and so that's I think, actually a little bit of a relief. Hmm. It was totally mundane. Totally mundane. Anyway, uh, beyond those two things, is there anything you're doing for yourself personally? Um, more work. Try to get as many contact contracts as possible. You did talk about, uh, or you did talk potentially about staying in contact with the lady who hired you out in New York. Yeah. And you do so. You actually take on a couple of jobs she has here in Chicago. You managed to earn yourself a little pocket money, which I'll give you in a little bit. And... In doing so, you actually grow your business a little bit, which impacts your credit rating. Right. Uh, the nice part about that for you is that you're not so, you know, on the lower tier of detectives anymore. Now you've got a little bit of street cred, uh, and that helps you a ton. Yes, which in the long run helps me get more jobs. That's right. Doctor? Yeah. Talk to me about how you spend a year or so before we pick up in season two. Uh, well, definitely one of the things that has bugged the doctor <clears throat> up to uh, one of the one of the big things that bugged the doctor during our last investigation mm -hmm. was Dunning. Uh, Dunning really that stuck with him. The conditions at Dunning um, that was that was a big thing. So he's aside from growing his business, which is growing his practice, you right. know, trying to take on as many people as possible, mm -hmm. as many patients as possible. He's actually going to, um, he's going to start basically drawing attention to the horrid conditions, kind of spearheading a, uh, a championing, if you will, um, against Dunning. So uh, you raise public concern. Are you going to go to um, raise public concern? I'm going to go to the courthouse. Basically, go down to go downtown with it. And, and you're going to become a public menace. I'm going to become a public menace. Okay. In every way in every way my fastidious little German self <laughs> can be. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, nice. Just remember, there was there was a terrible incident there where somebody was knocking down doors and murdering orderlies. Yeah, so. there was. Yeah, we want to talk about that, <laughs> right? Uh, <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm definitely. And then in my own in my own spare time um i think i'm probably gonna end up taking taking some classes back to the uh, back to the classroom back to the classroom and um, in fact the uh going back to the last investigation his knowledge of the human brain he realized was not up to snuff so hmm. psychology is actually going to be one of the two things and well frankly miss o'Shea has gotten gotten him intrigued in all of this crazy hoodoo, hmm. voodoo hmm. nonsense so he's gonna start Hanging around with Miss O'Shea in the evenings occasionally. And I told you about hanging around with that kind of crowd. Uh, that's exactly why he's doing it. Uh, I think <laughs> it's, too, right? it's, it's almost like oil and water. Yeah. Like, you know the two don't Very mix. Much. One is pure science. One is pure something else. Um, but let's, let's compartmentalize Dunning for a second. Yes. yes. Uh, so with Dunning and you becoming kind of a champion of uh, the downtrodden and the sick and the infirm... Uh, you cause quite a stink over the several months, whether it be uh, court cases that you get open by pro bono lawyers for patients or whether it be people in the street protesting out in front of Dunning. I will bring water from Dunning and actually manage to slip it to judges if I need to, like in talks. Okay. Like, hey, you've been drinking this swill. <laughs> you, you pull out some serious stops. Oh, yeah. Uh, it pays off about eight months later Fantastic. when the city of Chicago and some of the health and labor boards there open an official investigation into the water situation at Chicago State Hospital at Dunning. And what they find in the subsequent investigation disturbs them to the point where uh, they bring a formal fine and an immediate requirement to bring the water cisterns and the pollution, honestly, that's in the water uh, up to code or up to a level that will not make people sick. Fantastic. Yep. Fantastic. That is exactly what the exactly what the doctor wanted. Uh, those people already are suffering enough. They don't need to also be suffering water that you have to chew. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely something that you hang your head on. Uh, it's also something that has a 
rather positive effect on your practice. Uh, a lot of people in the surrounding neighborhoods begin seeing you as more of a public figure. And many of the people who went to you for the simple and basic stuff um, also come to you for needs that are maybe even a slight tinge political uh, because they see you as a voice in the community. People ask you to run for office. Well, you don't do that because you don't have time. Um, but you, you, you are beginning to get asked to be more of an upfront uh, I will, uh, face. I will definitely help those people then. Um, so talk to me about what else Dr. Tottenbach is going to do with his time. Yeah. Um, We've got the situation at Dunning. Sure. We know you're going to spend some time in study. And sure. we know you're probably going to spend a little time with Miss O'Shea talking about strange occultic things. Yes. Um, that's been my, his interest has been piqued um, vis-a-vis the occult, considering our last couple yeah. of months worth of hoopla. Well, in this case, the last like year or so. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, plus and possibly use it as a, as a way to understand maybe what happened before. Absolutely. And there is a big tie-in between the psychology that he's taking and the occult that he's hmm. learning. Uh, you know, um, there is a whole whole aspect of, of the occult that involves involves the the temperament of the brain. Hmm. Okay. Well, it gives us a pretty good idea where he's at. So, Miss hmm. O'Shea, tell me how you're spending your time. Well, um, I finished up uh, Swift's journal. Mm-hmm. You did. Um, so, um, and then I'll look into uh, some of the things because it looks like I may have found um, certain spells. So mm-hmm. uh, I'm going to look into those more. Yes, there are some, a select number of actual long form spell works within his book. Uh, I've given you a short list of them there. So. If you would like to spend a little time researching them, uh, maybe not necessarily incanting and using them, right? But just kind of getting a rough idea as to what they do. Sure, right? Not a problem. Yeah, I don't know if necessarily any of them are things I want to actually do. Sure, but I do want to be prepared in case. You're gonna see your mom. Yes, I am going to see my mom and talk with Christopher and potentially look for a place out there. Okay. Um, but uh, I'm still not sure what I'm doing in Chicago yet. Sure. I also, before I decide if I'm going to move to Arkham, need to know if I'm going to have a job. Yeah, so. I, I don't think... You probably don't get any immediate offers of employment unless you're going out and looking for them. You might get the odd night here or night there. But probably one of the things that strikes you on a couple, a couple of your first trips back to Arkham is... Your mother has kind of, um, she's kind of latched on to Professor Cross. Uh, she sees him not necessarily as a, I mean, she sees him as a good man. And he seems to become a foundational stone for her to potentially build some of her own sanity back. And so the doctors at Arkham encourage him to see her and he has time sometimes on a daily basis to stop in after he's done teaching at the university to, you know, just commiserate with her and, you know, kind of be that common influence on her of somebody who's not completely lost in the head like she is. Well, that's always nice. Yeah. And I, I think, I think Miss O'Shea would get the impression probably early on after her first couple of visits, that your mother maybe is kind of secretly playing matchmaker with him and you. She seems to talk him up. She keeps talking about, well, he's, look what he's done at the university, and it would be nice to have you here, and you already know someone. You have, you know, a friend, and who knows? She does a lot of, (laughs) she, she gives you a lot of lines where you could see if they were in dialogue, there would be several dots afterwards. And she's hoping you'll simply fill in those dots with your own thoughts. Whether you do or not is, is purely up to you. It really isn't until maybe six or eight months down the road of your consistent visits that Professor Cross makes his general feelings about you pretty well known. He's not rude about it or uh, brash about it, but he's 
you know, sort of in a gentlemanly way. At one point, after seeing your mother, he lets you know that it would he would rather you be here in Arkham. Not just that it would benefit your mom, but that maybe it would benefit the two of you. Yeah. And whatever you do with that massive emotional lodestone that he puts on you <laughs> uh, is totally up to you. You are obviously in the middle of a couple of different things. so Right. Yeah, I'll. that's why, I mean, I'll look, but I haven't decided. So, you know, see what's available, what kind of things I'm looking at, what kind of expenses I'm thinking about, you know. But not quite decide. Okay. I mean, because right now, I mean, going back and forth is expensive enough anyways. Yeah, you don't get the impression that he's asking you to decide. Right. You get the impression that he's <laughs> he's telling you that he has uh, an interest, a direct interest in you, and uh, is hoping that someday that you might decide to come here. I mean, after all, Arkham's a beautiful place. Yeah. It's also weird, as I found out. So you do find the city gets a little stranger every time you arrive. Mm-hmm. Fishman, fishman, roly <laughs> poly, fishman. Mm, <laughs> nothing direct. I mean, that's that maybe is in a city somewhere up the coast, but not not here, not right now. What's weird, really, about Arkham is the university. There's a lot of strange things that seem to go on in the university. Odd classes. Yeah, um, does uh, Pierce show up again? At the... you, you know, Dr. Pierce is not in Arkham. Uh, and Professor Cross says, probably about about six months into it, that he, he mentions to you, he asks you if you've seen Dr. Pierce. Uh, and you haven't, and then he right. hasn't either. And so he just, he mentions that the, the doctor comes and goes, and at some point, uh, maybe he'll turn up again. Huh. And he's just kind of like, yeah, whatever. He just comes and goes. <laughs> Well, uh, he has a lot of other things to concern himself with, uh, Professor Cross, that is. I mean, right. he's, he's teaching several classes at the university. He's helping take care of your mother. He's mm-hmm. somewhat uh, with no shame trying to get you to move across the country <laughs> to be with him. So, I mean, like, he's the, the man's got a full plate. Right. Um, he can't worry about Dr. Dr. Pierce. If Dr. Pierce shows back up, wonderful, but... Right. Okay. okay. Yeah. So, I think... That's about where I'll end our season finale tonight. I want to take a a moment to talk about what's going to happen in season two to get the listeners up to date. Stuff that the players already know. Season two is going to include some pretty serious change uh, as far as what the characters can do. They're going to get the option to kind of poke their toe a bit into the waters of the pulp universe. And in doing so, hopefully will give them the strength that they need as we begin our Masks of Nyarlathotep campaign, which begins next episode. So I want to thank each and every one of you that have listened to us on Season 1. I know that we had our own struggles audio-wise in the first few episodes, but hopefully we are coming in loud and clear now. And I look forward to seeing you all in Season 2. Thank you.